Uh, our lecture today, uh, this is uh, lecture 22, this is going to be on plasticity uh, after brain damage. And in particular, we're going to be taking a look at things like concussion, uh, for example, and uh, what happens as a consequence of concussion. And of course, this has important implications for uh, various sports, uh, for example, in which uh, there's a, a physical uh, contact that, that takes place that can lead to uh, concussion. Uh, so when we take a look at this whole idea of plasticity uh, after brain damage, we, are, we know that uh, uh, there's recovery uh, to some extent that takes place. Uh, and one of the primary concerns of uh, the field of behavioral neuroscience is to be able to to quantify um, uh, exactly what is happening uh, as a consequence of, uh, uh, of this recovery and how much uh, behavioral recovery can actually occur. So again, uh, we're going to be talking about kind of a wide spectrum of, um, uh, of research uh, in, in this particular area. But I think it's a, certainly a, a very important one, uh, the applied uh, nature uh, of this research is important um, uh, in, the, in this field. Um, and uh, you'll see how, uh, as we go along, I think, uh, how certain uh, applications of uh, basic research is it's helping us to understand um, this, uh, this whole issue of uh, plasticity and helping us to understand various uh, disorders, for example, that are related to brain damage. So some important factors in understanding recovery from brain damage. Um, when we take a look at individuals who have uh, indeed suffered brain damage, uh, sometimes the recovery is um, uh, slow. Uh, certainly it's subtle, uh, but uh, there can be significant recovery uh, that does occur. And the mechanisms that are responsible for this recovery are indeed some of the mechanisms that we've already talked about in terms of brain development. In other words, what is happening in terms of branching, for example, of axons and dendrites? Uh, is this something that uh, happens in an individual where there has been uh, brain damage? So uh, some cases of brain damage. Again, if you look um, at this figure that you see right here, uh, this shows, you know, various uh, causes uh, of brain injury, certainly trauma uh, of the brain, uh, seizures, tumors, uh, aneurysms, infections, uh, exposure to various drugs like alcohol, for example, uh, various disease states, stroke, um, uh, uh, having some kind of brain surgery. I mean, these are all, you know, acquired brain injury causes. And we're going to focus in on a few of them. Uh, and indeed, the ones that we're going to focus in on the most are the, you know, closed head injuries, you know, concussions and uh, various degenerative uh, kinds of diseases. That doesn't mean that these other sources uh, are not uh, as important. Um, but um, uh, it's these two that we're really going to be focusing most of our attention on in uh, this lecture today. So um, one of the things I mentioned when we were going over methods was, uh, you know, that I would be presenting different uh, methodology uh, that is unique to that particular area. And certainly the whole field of neuropsychology uh, has uh, a number of ways of, of trying to assess uh, uh, brain injury, of trying to diagnose brain injury. And this is a, a very common one that you see here. Uh, and indeed, I think that I, uh, you know, there's a, a videotape uh, that you should have watched uh, on this uh, Wisconsin card sorting test, which will, I think, help you to, to understand it a, um, uh, even better uh, than what I have illustrated uh, on this particular slide. But you can see here, uh, this woman is, is uh, starting this particular test. And the test consists of a series of cards that have these uh, symbols on them. Uh, and the cards are of different colors. 
Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, she is sorting uh, on the basis of color. So the stack of cards, she, she takes a look at one at a time. She's holding this one with this green symbol on it uh, right now. Uh, and um, she's sorting uh, on the basis of color. Okay, we have on this card, uh, the target card that you see right here, uh, this consists of three um, uh, circles uh, that are green. Um, she has to guess until she learns which principle, meaning the color or the shape or the number, uh, guides her uh, in her sorting. Uh, and um, the uh, person who is supervising uh, the test, the examiner, is going to periodically change the mode. Uh, sometimes it's going to be color, sometimes it's going to be shape, sometimes it's going to be number. But uh, for example, in this case, she's placing it in this tray and the examiner would say correct. Uh, and then she would keep sorting again on the basis of color. Uh, so this card right here would go uh, would match up with with this uh, uh, particular target card and she would place it here. So the examiner will do this for a period of time, in this case uh, on the basis of color, but then they'll shift uh, in terms of shape. Um, uh, and um, uh, again, uh, the, the examiner would say correct or would say incorrect. Um, and so um, this is going to be constantly shifting. Um, and um, uh, for a while, it's going to be on the basis of color. For a while, it'll be on the basis of shape. For a while, it'll be on a number, and we'll keep shifting that around. Um, but what happens with individuals that have suffered some degree of brain damage is they keep uh, perseverating on uh, a particular modality. In other words, they don't recognize that what they're doing is wrong. Uh, and indeed, it takes them a lot longer to recognize that they now should be uh, sorting on the basis of another modality. Uh, so this is a, a test, a very common test that is used uh, to, uh, to examine the integrity of the brain uh, and to diagnose whether an individual might be suffering from some degree um, of brain damage. So closed head injuries, what we call concussions, um, this figure that you see here, uh, I think illustrates very well what happens in terms of a whiplash uh, kind of injury where there's a sharp blow uh, to the head that drives the brain tissue against the inside of the wall, the skull, as you can see here and as you can see here, okay. So again, uh, one of the main causes, this is one of the main causes of brain injury that we see in young adults. Uh, and again, it's, it's this, uh, I call it the rattling, okay, of the brain up against, um, uh, the rattling of brain tissue up against the inside wall uh, of the skull. So what actually happens during a concussion? Uh, what actually happens is that the inside uh, of the skull uh, um, uh, again, the, the brain is being pushed up against the inside and you're getting bruising uh, uh, of that tissue. Uh, in some cases, it's stretching uh, and it's tearing nerve fibers. You're getting a change in terms of those really important ions uh, that we've talked about in terms of the action potentials that can really change the way in which uh, nerve cells uh, actually function. Uh, blood flow is being reduced, uh, and a lot of energy now is being directed to trying to repair that area of the brain. Um, and one of the things that's particularly bothersome in this area of, of examining concussions is the fact that uh, if an individual has what we would call subconcussive blows, which actually fall short, okay, of the basic. Uh, uh, very severe kinds of concussions that I think that we're familiar with. The accumulation of those, if an individual has a lot of those subconcussive blows, they can be as damaging, if not more damaging, than a full-blown concussion. So that's something to keep in mind, especially as we take a look at some of the 
data in the area of concussions in, in athletics where, for example, in the case of football, a person uh, plays a game of football might be having a lot of subconcussive blows by way of practices, by way of playing in games. And again, those subconcussive blows as they accumulate can uh, uh, be as devastating and as serious as, uh, as an actual concussion. So this um, uh, um, descriptor that we see here uh, called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. Um, at one time, I think that we refer to it as uh, being uh, punch uh, drunk. It's a very progressive degenerative brain disease. Uh, and unfortunately, it can only be detected once a person has passed away. It can only be detected post-mortem. Now, I'll talk later on about something that might change that whole picture, but this, of course, does not allow us to examine whether or not an individual is actually suffering from this particular disorder until we do some kind of post-mortem examination on the brain. Uh, so this was at one time called dementia pugilistica, or being punch drunk, and it was associated with the sport uh, of boxing. Uh, contact sports, uh, especially football, ice hockey, wrestling, um, anything uh, in which there's repetitive kind of brain trauma, uh, those can be particularly devastating uh, to, to um, individuals that are participating uh, in those um, uh, athletic contests that includes that severe contact. Um, and one of the things that we know is there's an accumulation in the brain and some certain key brain areas of what we call the tau protein, uh, which is an abnormal uh, protein. And again, it's something that is associated with um, uh, concussion. Um, what you see in terms of behavioral symptoms, uh, again, you get this dementia, you know, memory problems, uh, uh, depression, mood swings, confusion, uh, aggressive behavior. These are all things that are associated with uh, CTE. So if you take a look uh, at this figure, uh, this shows a normal brain uh, that you see right here. This is the brain um, of a football player, um, uh, uh, an individual who uh, played the, the sport of football for, for a number of years. Um, and one of the things, is that, and these are the this abnormal tau protein that you see here, uh, contrast and compare the two. Um, and you see, you know, very pronounced uh, differences in terms of the tissue uh, in the brain and these protein tangles, these abnormal protein tangles that you see here. Uh, this is really interesting because one of the things that we know, and we'll take a look at this more when we get to the area of, um, uh, of uh, memory, um, Alzheimer's disease um, shows these uh, individuals, Alzheimer's disease, show the same kind of changes in the brain that we see in uh, athletes that have had these repeated kinds of concussions. So it's a very interesting uh, association. Um, you know, this uh, the whole story is a very interesting one as it pertains to the game of football. Uh, many of you may have seen the movie from a few years ago, which was called Concussion, which really highlighted the life of this individual right here, Bennett Amalu, who um, conducted a postmortem examination on this uh, football player that we see here, Mike Webster, who was uh, a Hall of Fame player that played for the Pittsburgh Steelers a number of years ago. And uh, um, he found uh, on that postmortem examination very uh, uh, significant uh, CTE uh, in, in this individual. And it really brought uh, important light to the problem um, uh, in the game of football and especially the game of uh, uh, professional uh, football. Uh, so there was a movie um, documentary that came out on PBS uh, a few years back, uh, which was simply called League of Denial. And it was all about how uh, the NFL, the National Football League, had been denying that there was a problem for a very long period of time. Um, but now, um, uh, you know, many of these uh, players, uh, former players, have donated their brains uh, to um, being examined uh, for uh, CTE uh, and um, 
uh, as that evidence accumulates at this institute at uh, Boston University, more and more of these brains are found to have uh, evidence of the CTE. And there's been a legal um, uh, uh, settlement uh, that has occurred uh, in order to um, uh, uh, pay uh, former athletes that uh, suffer from this uh, 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 disorder. But it's an ongoing problem um, in, uh, in sports and, in, and not just in the game of football. Uh, so when you take a look at some of these uh, brains that you see from football players, this is a, a particularly tragic case here of this individual, Dave Dorson, who played uh, for a number of years with the Chicago Bears and uh, New York Giants. And uh, he underwent uh, very severe depression and cognitive problems after he retired. Uh, and he uh, took his own life. And before he took his own life, uh, he wrote this, you know, please see that my brain is given to the National Football League Brain Bank. Um, and indeed, when that brain was examined, uh, there was evidence of this tau protein, that uh, this abnormal protein that you see here and here and here and here uh, in, uh, in his brain. Uh, and there have been, you know, a number of other Pieces of this, uh, another uh, football player by the name of Junior Seau, uh, another uh, just uh, incredibly uh, good player who uh, was elected into the Hall of Fame when he retired. Uh, he suffered from very severe depression and cognitive problems, and uh, he too committed suicide, and his brain was donated to this brain bank uh, by his family, and he too was found to have um, evidence of this uh, abnormal uh, protein uh, um, and the CTE syndrome. Uh, another player for the Kansas City Chiefs, Jovan Belcher, uh, killed his wife and committed suicide. Uh, very severe mood disorders, uh, probably should have been diagnosed as being uh, bipolar. Uh, but uncontrollable anger and hostility. And again, when his brain was examined, they also found uh, evidence of this abnormal uh, protein. Uh, another player from way back, uh, Frank Gifford, who was married to the uh, celebrity Kathy Lee for a number of years. Um, uh, he too, uh, his family donated his brain indeed towards the end of his uh, life in the last uh, tenor. He, he died, I believe it was, in his mid 80s. Uh, and um, for the last 10 years of his, life, of his life, had been suffering from very severe uh, mood changes and depression. And when his brain was examined, he too was diagnosed uh, with C. Uh, another player, Tony Dorsett, uh, with the Dallas Cowboys, uh, suffered from uh, CTE as well. Uh, he is still alive, but he has been deteriorating in terms of uh, his uh, uh, cognitive uh, functioning, uh, becoming very uh, forgetful and also experiencing uh, uh, mood uh, changes. Um, certainly, um, you know, it's uh, strongly suspected that uh, his brain might also um, show evidence uh, of this uh, uh, tau, abnormal tau protein. Uh, and uh, again, it's not something that we can assess um, prior to an individual uh, has passed away. The only way we can assess it is post-mortem. Uh, and then more recently, in this very famous case of this uh, football player for the New England Patriots, Aaron Hernandez, um, he was uh, convicted of uh, uh, homicide, uh, and he was in jail, and in jail he committed suicide. Uh, and his brain showed some of the most advanced um, uh, cases of CTE. Again, here's his brain that you see right here. Here's a normal brain that you see here. Notice the enlarged ventricles and notice uh, these uh, gaps that you see here. Uh, this is, uh, you know, very, uh, very, very severe uh, CTE. Uh, so again, the risks are real. A lot of uh, interesting work is being done now with uh, taking a look at uh, high school players and indeed youth football players. And one of the things that we know, for example, is that in high school players, they're twice as likely to have uh, concussions than, than college players you know, even. 
Um, so again, this is this is of uh, great concern. Um, this is an interesting study that came out um, a few years back, uh, in which they took a look at the age of first exposure to football uh, and cognitive impairments, and this was all being done on former. Uh, professional football players, and it was found that the, you know, the there was an association uh, between participating in tackle football prior to the age of 12 and and these cognitive impairments later on in life. Again, using uh, uh, various uh, neuropsychological tests like the Wisconsin uh, card sorting test, for example. So these, uh, you know, repeated impacts, uh, head impacts during this, you know, developmental, obviously important developmental period of time, you can risk uh, cognitive impairment later on. Um, this is a, you know, an incredibly um, important study uh, and um, uh, one that uh, I think more and more we're paying attention to uh, as it relates to, um, you know, when, uh, kids should uh, be allowed to, to play um, this uh, uh, sport that involves this uh, uh, potential uh, for concussion. Uh, this is an interesting study that was done <clears throat> by this scientist, Visar uh, Barisha, uh, in which he was taking a look at language use in uh, football players and trying to use this as a sign, an early sign for um, uh, CTE. So he, what he did was he took a look at transcripts of player interviews before games and after games. And what he found was a very steep decline in terms of um, the, the kind of the richness of the vocabulary that they used. Um, that is, uh, you know, the number of verbs, nouns, adjectives, adverbs to the total number of words that they spoke. Uh, and when you take a look at that and you see what happens you know, before and after, before and after concussions, before and after um, um, uh, contact, uh, indeed, and begin to compare it to uh, coaches or executives and the kind of language that they use uh, in a news conference or in an interview. Um, uh, the, the, the deficits that you see in these football players in terms of the uh, absence of the richness of language, uh, again, before and after, uh, is something that's, you know, might be a very telling sign of uh, maybe early onset uh, of um, CT. Um, the future of the game, I think, is in serious jeopardy. This is a picture that was taken uh, a year ago uh, of a uh, football, uh, excuse me, uh, this was a year ago of a football um, squad, high school football squad in uh, Texas. Uh, and it was from a school that was well known for having an excellent football team. So this was, you know, last year and this was just 10 years ago. Uh, and this team, this high school has had a lot of success um, in, in terms of winning uh, championships and a very, very successful uh, run. But now uh, fewer and fewer kids are playing. Uh, and I think that this is something that is that is happening uh, nationally uh, in, in the United States. So participation in tackle football is down. Uh, and the ages of 6 to 12 has fallen uh, by about 20 percent uh, since uh, 2009. Um, schools in a number of states have actually shut down their tackle football programs. Again, a lot of safety concerns. Uh, and insurance companies are, are increasing their liability rates, uh, going to what's called a la carte um, 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 liability uh, premiums. So a sport like uh, golf, for example, or a sport like tennis. Um, the liability insurance, the premiums is far less than sports like lacrosse or football, for example. And it's pricing out um, uh, schools uh, oftentimes in terms of um, their, their desire to want to support those sports where the premiums are so high. And this is something that's happening uh, nationally. Uh, so the demise of football, you know, what might happen when there is a reliable biomarker for CTE, 
Um, this woman that you see right here, Ann McKee at Boston University, who runs an institute there, uh, specifically designed to take a look uh, at CTE. And she's been trying to come up with a biomarker. And recently she has found elevated levels of a particular protein that's involved in, in inflammation uh, of the brain uh, as a consequence of concussion. And it's simply called CCL11. And what she has done is she's uh, taken a look at those levels in uh, X players uh, compared with non-athletes. And uh, what she sees is much higher levels. And levels were higher in those who played in the game for a longer period of time. Um, and there's hope that maybe this will serve as a biomarker, uh, something that we can take a look at um, uh, early on, you know, not have to wait for a postmortem examination, but indeed be able to detect uh, whether or not uh, this is a person that's going to be at risk uh, for uh, the development of, of CTE. If we have a reliable biomarker, uh, that's uh, certainly going to help us in terms of making a diagnosis and indeed um, uh, short circuiting the possibility that an individual will continue to participate uh, in that sport and suffer even further uh, impairment. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about axon sprouting. Uh, I think this is a, an important uh, concept. Uh, one of the things that happens when the brain is damaged um, is that um, you, you, you see um, that um, uh, collateral sprouts um, eventually begin to, to form. Uh, so, for example, after an injury, you're seeing degeneration of certain axons. Here's the case of this degeneration that's taking place. Um, but um, this collateral sprouting, where you're getting a sprout that's coming off of another axon, um, that can fill um, uh, vacant uh, synapses, so it can actually replace this. So this collateral sprouting is something that we know can uh, occur. Um, uh, you know, over a several month period of time, those sprouts can fill in um, uh, vacated uh, areas, vacated synapses, and they can be uh, useful um, um, uh, in terms of uh, repair uh, that takes place in the brain. Um, this is also an interesting phenomenon here that's called um, uh, reorganization uh, of uh, uh, sensory uh, representation. You know, what would happen if you, if you took, uh, in this case, the research is being done with uh, infrahuman primates, it's being done with chimpanzees, if, if the, um, the finger that you see right here um, uh, the third uh, digit uh, was surgically removed, uh, what would happen in terms of uh, what the somatosensory cortex looks like. Uh, so again, this is a case in which there's an amputation, uh, and we're going to take a look uh, at the uh, somatosensory cortex and the cortical area that was previously responsive to that third finger now becomes responsive to the second and the fourth. So you get this reorganization uh, that, that, that takes place here uh, after uh, this amputation. So again, the brain does possess that capability of, of reorganizing. Um, this also leads to you know, another interesting phenomenon that's called uh, phantom limb, uh, in which you're also seeing cortical reorganization. Uh, this is something that occurs when uh, nerves uh, that, that normally are responsible uh, for a particular limb, for example, um, the phantom limb occurs when those nerves that normally innervate that missing limb begin to cause pain. Uh, and uh, the, one of the things that we know is that the cortex is reorganizing after that amputation and it's becoming responsive to other uh, parts of the body. So again, this is just another case of, of what we talked about in that earlier uh, situation uh, with uh, uh, the finger uh, amputation and the reorganization that was taking place. You know, there are a number of interesting animal models of brain injury and recovery. Um, one of the things that we know, for example, if you take a look at this rat that you see right here, this rat is uh, reaching for a pellet of food, and it's doing it by, by reaching uh, by way of its paw. 
uh, uh, in order to grasp uh, that pellet of food. So those grasping movements, the extension that takes place, the, the grasping of it and the ultimate retrieval of it and the animal putting it in its mouth, um, those are things that are very similar to what we see in the case of human beings. And there's a lot of interesting work that has been done to uh, explore um, uh, uh, in, in rodents what happens as a consequence of certain types of brain injury and what happens to those grasping kinds of responses. And it may help us to identify uh, various uh, therapeutic um, approaches um, that, that may be helpful for human beings that are suffering from some kind of brain damage. Uh, so indeed, that, that work is ongoing and is uh, very important in terms of trying to help us to understand um, uh, and to develop, uh, to understand brain damage, but also to help to develop various um, kinds of approaches, therapeutic approaches to helping individuals with brain injury. Um, this uh, lastly is a uh, uh, an interesting uh, model that's also used uh, for looking at uh, concussion uh, and brain injury. And um, it's uh, essentially bla what we call blast-induced neurotrauma. This is a tube uh, that can be activated uh, that you see right here, high-pressure high nitrogen gas-filled tube. Um, and uh, what we can do when we activate this, it's going to push air uh, towards the uh, cranium of, of an animal that's been restrained, in this case a rat, and we're looking at the right side of the cranium now. Cranium now. And it really mimics what's, what is seen in terms of human concussion. Uh, and this has been um, a device now that's been used, you know, the, the rapid pushing of this air towards the cranium to produce a concussion. Uh, and it's been used very successfully uh, in terms of helping us to understand uh, what happens uh, with brain trauma. Uh, and um, uh, again, this is, uh, you know, uh, along the lines of animal models uh, that uh, have become very valuable for uh, taking a look at things like, like CTE, for example. So um, this kind of wraps up this area, and we're going to be moving on to an exploration of uh, adolescence and the adolescent brain, which I think is a very, very interesting topic. So we'll take a look at that in our next lecture.